Have you ever stopped to think that during a simple walk out in nature, you could be looking for precious stones? For a lot of people around the world, this is a relaxing, almost therapeutic hobby. And for those who get more experienced, it can even become quite profitable sometimes. But how can you watching this video right now actually do that in a safe and accessible way? And more importantly, how can you know exactly where those gemstones are in the first place? That's exactly where geological maps come in. These maps were created by experienced geologists who have already mapped the occurrence of certain rock types and minerals in many regions around the world, including the area where you live. And as complex as these maps may look at first, they can still be used as a real game changer because they allow you to have an idea of what you might find before you even start searching. But how are you supposed to read a map like that? Usually they have specific colors, irregular lines and symbols that, at first glance, don't seem to make much sense. For most people, it's just a confusing sheet of paper. But for someone who understands what's going on, that same map completely changes the game when it comes to setting expectations about what might be hidden in the ground, whether you're hoping to find tourmalines, garnets, sapphires, or even diamonds in alluvial deposits. So instead of walking around randomly in nature, you start to know exactly which areas contain the right rocks, where rivers concentrate heavy minerals, and which regions have the ideal geologic history to produce precious stones. And that's exactly what you're going to learn in today's video, how to find precious stones using geological maps, so that before you even pick up a hammer, a screen, or a loop, you already know what makes sense to look for because a true gem hunter walks into the field with a geological map in hand, already knowing what they might encounter. This kind of map summarizes decades of work from geologists who have already done the heavy lifting of identifying where gemstone hosting rocks are, such as basalts, serpentinites, granites, and pegmatites. And you're about to tap into that knowledge. The first thing you need to understand is how to use a geological map as a gem hunting tool so you actually know what you're looking at. The difference between a regular map and a geological map is simple. A regular map shows where things are today. A geological map shows how the rocks got there over millions of years. The colors represent different rock types and geologic ages. The lines mark contacts between units, faults, folds, and formation boundaries. And in many cases, the legend brings direct descriptions of the symbols on the map, like schist with garnet and mica, serpentinite, granite and pegmatite dikes, or alluvial deposits with heavy minerals. In practice, you're always going to follow the same logic. First, you look at the legend. That's where the map tells you which rock types are present in that area. If you see terms like schist, gneiss, amphibolite, mica schist, or garnet schist, you already know you're in a metamorphic belt regions where pressure and temperature have transformed ordinary rocks into rocks rich in minerals like garnet, mica, storolite, kyanite, and in some cases, corundum, which is the mineral behind rubies and sapphires. If the legend shows granite, pegmatite, or apelite, you're in an area favorable for the formation of large crystals of quartz, feldspar, tourmaline, beryl, which can be aquamarine or emerald in specific environments, and topaz, if serpentinite ultramafic rocks or ophiolite complex appear, that's a signal for possible jade occurrences, especially nephrite jade associated with serpentinite and magnesium and iron-rich minerals such as olivine and actinolite. Beyond the names, it's important to notice how these rocks are distributed. Wide, continuous areas of schist and gneiss indicate large metamorphic zones where you can search for garnet in stream beds that cut through those formations. Narrow bands of serpentinite mark ancient plate boundaries, which are classic environments for jade in old subduction zones. Small pegmatite bodies cutting through larger granites show up as spots or veins on more detailed maps, and those late-stage intrusions are exactly the ones that tend to concentrate high-quality tourmaline, topaz, and beryl. Finally, many geological maps in the United States also show units labeled alluvium, or river terrace deposits. These recent sand and gravel deposits are where rivers lay down material eroded from mountain rocks. In regions with a history of kimberlites, lamproits, or corundum-rich rocks, those alluvial deposits can concentrate diamonds, sapphires, rubies, 
and garnets. Instead of checking every random stone in every river, you use the map to figure out which rivers actually flow through the right rocks before reaching the plain where you'll be collecting. Now that you understand what the colors and names mean, we need to connect each geologic environment to specific gemstones. Let's start with pegmatites because they're basically factories for large crystals. On maps, pegmatites appear associated with granites, often described as granitic pegmatite or pegmatite dikes. When you see that in the legend, you can think of tourmaline, beryl, including aquamarine, topaz, smoky quartz, and in some cases, rare lithium minerals. In the field, these pegmatites usually form light-colored outcrops with large crystals of quartz and feldspar, and veins where dark or colorful tourmalines stand out. It's the classic pegmatite setting where a valuable green or pink tourmaline can show up. Metamorphic belts of schist and gneiss indicate intense metamorphism. Schists with a lot of mica have a foliated texture, shine in the light because of the mica crystals, and may contain garnets as small reddish balls in the rock. Those garnets often end up in riverbeds as small, rounded, dark red grains with a vitreous luster. If the map indicates garnet mica schist or amphibolite with garnet, you can be almost sure garnet will be there. And garnets, besides having their own value as gemstones, are excellent indicator minerals for other deposits, including some environments where diamonds can occur. Serpentinite, in turn, is a dark to greenish rock, smooth to the touch when weathered, and often associated with actinolite, epidote, and magnetite. On maps, when you see serpentinite or ultramafic rocks, you're dealing with fragments of the upper mantle or with heavily altered mafic rocks. In some regions, such as parts of the Western United States, serpentinite is directly linked to nephrite jade occurrences. Rough jade can look like a simple, opaque green mass, fairly hard and with a higher density than most common rocks. If you see serpentinite on the map and in the field, you find compact green blocks, smooth with fibrous or granular fracture. It's worth testing hardness, density, and texture carefully. And we can't forget alluvial deposits. On maps, units labeled alluvium or river gravel mark areas where you're not going to be breaking rock, but screening gravel. When those deposits lie downstream from kimberlites, lamproits, garnet, and corundum-rich schists, or pegmatites with garnet in barrel, the chance of finding rolled stones of garnet, sapphire, zircon, topaz, and even diamond increases a lot. That's when simple tests come into play. Hardness, checking if it scratches common glass. Density, how heavy in the hand it feels compared to an ordinary pebble. Luster, vitreous, resinous, greasy, and surface texture. This way, you're not relying only on intuition. You're connecting the map to the physical processes that concentrated those gems in that specific gravel. And being able to interpret the map is half the job. The other half is turning that information into a realistic field plan. You start by choosing a region in the United States with a history or good potential for gemstones, such as metamorphic belts with schist and gneiss, granitic areas with exposed pegmatites, or well-known serpentinite zones. Then you locate the units of interest on geological maps and see which roads, trails, rivers, and public access areas cross them. That way you avoid restricted private land and focus your energy on places where you can actually walk, observe, and collect. In the field, your first task is to confirm that what the map shows matches what you're seeing. If the map says pegmatite, you should be looking at light-colored rocks with large quartz and feldspar crystals. If it says schist, you should find foliated rocks with mica sheen that break into plates. If it says serpentinite, you're going to see dark green rock with a somewhat oily look, sometimes cut by actinolite or epidote veins. This confirmation is important because maps work with scale and simplification. Sometimes small local variations don't show up on paper. From there, you start looking for more direct evidence. In metamorphic regions, watch road cuts, slopes, and stream beds that cross schist or gneiss. Look for garnet in erosional spots as small, dark red grains in the heavy sand. In pegmatite areas, examine loose blocks around outcrops, looking for prismatic tourmaline crystals or pockets of quartz and feldspar with cavities. In serpentinite zones, observe compact green blocks and test hardness with a steel blade or glass. 
Nephrite jade is usually harder than common steel, whereas weathered serpentinite tends to be a bit softer. When you're in alluvial deposits mapped as alluvium, go straight to the points where the river changes direction, where the current slows down, or where small bars and inside bends form. These are the places where heavy materials accumulate. Use a simple screen or pan to concentrate the finer gravel. Stones with high density, vitreous or resinous luster, and hardness greater than common rocks should be set aside and examined calmly at home. The combination of geological maps, field observation, and simple tests of hardness, density, luster, and texture is what turns a casual walk into a real geologic investigation. Now that you've seen all this, I'm almost sure you've remembered at least one interesting little stone you found somewhere out in nature at some point in your life. And that's more common than you might think, especially after a video like this, because you'll almost certainly end up finding at least one of the types of stones you've seen here. That's why, before throwing anything away or ignoring it, you need to identify it properly so you don't accidentally waste a golden opportunity. And after all this, it's impossible not to wonder have you ever thrown away a gemstone without realizing it? Let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear your story and where you're watching from. But let's say you find something very different from the stones you've seen so far. You don't throw it away, you keep it. So now what? How do you really know what it is? That's where a practical tool I always recommend comes in for anyone taking their first steps and wanting to go beyond pure luck. The book, Gemology Journey for Beginners, available on Amazon. Inside, you'll find clear explanations about hardness, density, luster, simple at-home methods, and step-by-step -step guidance to figure out whether the stone in your hand is just ordinary quartz, an interesting garnet, a valuable agate, or even something rarer, like a diamond. Instead of depending only on what you remember from this video, you'll have a reference guide you can take with you into the field and use calmly at home. But if it's not the right moment for you to get the book, you can still subscribe for free and follow the next videos. Because in practice, what all these gems have in common isn't just their value potential, but the fact that they're accessible. You don't need a mining permit. You don't need heavy machinery. You don't need a fancy lab. You need attention, curiosity, and a few simple tests. Scratching glass to check hardness, observing the luster, whether it's vitreous, waxy, or greasy, feeling the weight in your hand to estimate density, and looking around to see whether you're standing on volcanic rocks, schists, gneisses, serpentinite, or granitic pegmatites. When you add up these details, that's what makes the difference between throwing away a special piece and recognizing material that can be cut and upgraded in value. And of course, this is just the beginning. In the next video, we're going to go even deeper into this journey getting into less obvious gemstones and talking about the best places to search in your region. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Good luck, gem hunter.